so there's nothing egotistical about this, but it is a remarkable achievement of what humanity can do. And it's not just scientists, right? This required um, people who developed the vials and the needles. This required deployment of individuals at Fox Chase. We have a vaccine clinic. So nurses who are normally taking care of our cancer patients are now being deployed to give vaccines. This required the efforts of so many people to develop these vaccines and then to get them into people's arms. And so I know you're tired and I know you're exhausted by this, but there is good from this. This is by far, by years, the fastest that we've developed a vaccine. Think about HIV. HIV has been with us since the, the early 80s and we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. This thing was developed in, and in arms in months. Um, so as I suspect all of you know, um, there are three vaccines that are currently available. Two of them, Moderna and Pfizer, are what we refer to as RNA vaccine. So this is actually an established technology. Moderna, the company, has been around for over a decade. And maybe this is obvious to you, but the last three letters of Moderna are RNA. The entire intent of that company was to develop vaccines just that had RNA with a little fat globule around the outside of them, with, with the intent that these would be the quickest to make and also the safest of vaccines to deliver to, um, to humans. So it is not by chance that the two RNA, uh, the two companies that made RNA vaccines were the first ones that were available because it's so straightforward to make these RNA vaccines. And this technology, even though these vaccines are new, this technology has actually been around for approximately a decade. So the timing worked rather beautifully for this. The intent, as I said, was to make these as pure as possible. So the, really the only thing that's in these RNA vaccines is the RNA that is in a sense, the recipe for encoding the spike protein. And this spike protein is what you make an immune response to. And that RNA is extraordinarily fragile. So it is encased in a little lipid bubble or a little fat globule. That fat globule does two things. First, it protects the RNA because otherwise this RNA, once it goes into your arm or into your muscle would get chewed up um, very, very quickly. But the second thing it does is that lipid globule looks very tasty to your muscle cells in your arm. And therefore that lipid globule will get taken up by muscle cells in your arm and that RNA will get translated into a protein. So think of the RNA like a recipe for dinner. Just holding the recipe itself isn't dinner, but it is the code or the, the, the instructions for how to make this. Once that spike protein gets made, and all of this happens within about 24 hours after you receive the vaccine, that spike protein is now produced and all of this is happening in your arm where the vaccine is delivered is picked up by immune cells here. And this is what is the catalyst for the immune response that then you make uh, throughout the body. It's the reason why your arm is almost always sore after this vaccine. So 95% of people, I still have a bit of a sore arm after, um, after my second vaccine. But this RNA, um, these RNA vaccines are as pared down and as simple a vaccine as you can get. It's the reason why they have to be kept at the extraordinarily cold temperatures that they must be kept at, because there are no preservatives, there are no other additives that are in them. It is simply this RNA molecule. Um, in terms of differences, one of the questions that Michael sent along was, well, how do Moderna and Pfizer differ? And there, there, are, so, there are some differences, um, but there, those differences are kind of more uh, technical. There are differences in freezer temperature, there are differences in how many doses are in a vial, there are differences in how much RNA is present within a given dose. Um, but in terms of a human's response to them, they are virtually identical. Um, so I cannot come up with a single reason why you should choose to get one over another of the RNA vaccines. Not a single reason for this. Um, in terms of side effects, so uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the side effects following these vaccines. I think an important thing to bear in mind is that one of the reasons why we were able to develop these vaccines as quickly as we did is that um, they didn't, the, the, the folks at Moderna and Pfizer couldn't have lots and lots of different trials. They had to say, let's commit to one particular regimen, a dosing regimen, and let's stick with that. 
right? So back in April or May of 2020, a bunch of folks sat around a table and they said, all right, how should we do this? And they gathered, they, they put their minds together and they said, all right, we're gonna give dose one, we're gonna wait three weeks or four weeks, and then we're gonna give dose two. This was at a time that they had no idea that their vaccine was gonna be successful, right? So this was a little bit of a roll of the dice. They were like, well, let's hope that this works. So we are sticking with this regimen because we know that this works. This has gone through phase one, two, and three trials. It has been completely safe and 95% effective, which again, at the risk of seeming almost silly with my exuberance is unheard of for vaccines. If we have a flu vaccine that somewhere gets around 45, 50%, that is you know, reason for confetti. So to now have a vaccine that is 95% effective is um, remarkable, is truly, truly remarkable. But one of the things that I will say as an immunologist is I have a feeling that second dose comes a little fast. Um, just think about what happens after the first dose. After the first dose of an RNA vaccine, your body has never seen this spike protein. And so it's learning something completely new. When you go back for your second dose, it's even though the, the, the vaccine is the same, the event looks like it's the same inside your body, everything is different you've already turned on an immune response to that spike protein. It's almost like the giant that you just trained after dose number one has just fallen asleep. And now you're coming at it and you throw a big rock at it with the second dose. And now that giant can be potentially kind of angry. And it's the reason why about 50% of people develop um, things that feel, well, you develop a low grade fever, some body aches um, after the second dose. It goes away quickly. It is not a long lasting concern. It certainly doesn't mean you're sick. If anything, it's an indication that your immune response is working effectively for you. And it is absolutely something that you can medicate for. So uh, when I got my second dose, I actually felt fine after my second dose. My wife felt less fine. Um, but next to the bed was a glass of water and a couple of naproxen, and just on the off chance that I woke up at 1 a.m. feeling kind of crappy. But these side effects are extraordinarily transient. Um, and I, again, I think it is because of the, the proximity of dose one um, and dose two. Um, we can talk about questions you might have about the RNA vaccines um, in, a, in a moment here, but let me just tell you about the new one, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So this one is a different virus, this is a different um, approach. Instead of this being an RNA-based vaccine, this is a recombinant viral vector. So what that means is that they've taken a virus that doesn't replicate, doesn't grow, it's called adenovirus, and they have spliced, let's say the genome of the virus is a circle, they have spliced into this circle the spike protein, exactly, or the spice, the, the spike gene, the exact same one that's in the RNA, uh, the RNA vaccines. Um, this virus doesn't replicate, so it won't make you sick, but it is packaged in a little delivery vehicle that looks just as tasty to your cells as that little lipid particle that the um, RNA vaccines are packaged in. Some of the differences with the J&J &J vaccine is unlike the RNA vaccines, the Johnson Johnson is just a single shot. So one and done, you're out, you're done. Um, and as a consequence, there are fewer side effects that are associated with the J&J &J vaccine. Um, in addition, it's a little bit less fussy than the RNA vaccines. The Moderna in, or the Pfizer in particular has to be kept at minus 80 Celsius, which is like minus 120 Fahrenheit. It's kind of a challenge to keep that thing um, intact. Um, and while that's an inconvenience here in Philadelphia area, it's an impossibility in developing parts of the world where uh, not only are minus 80 freezers not easy to find, um, but also electricity is, is variable. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I'm going to predict, is going to be the thing that's going to help cure the world. It may not be the vaccine you get, but this is going to be the Hale and Hardy vaccine, one shot, in and out, easy to keep. You can keep it refrigerated. It lasts for a long period of time. Um, and importantly, um, there are some people who are like, I don't want the Johnson & Johnson because it's less effective. They've heard that the e efficacy of this is about 75% versus 95%. So here comes another uh, analogy for you. I think it's number two of the evening. There'll probably be uh, one or two more. If you go to a baseball game 
And in the fifth inning, and it's a standard baseball game, and in the fifth inning, somebody hits a home run, that's very exciting. But now imagine that you go to a baseball game, and in the third inning, somebody hits a grand slam, and in the fourth inning, another grand slam. And now in the fifth inning, here comes the home run. I'm going to bet that you're going to be like, meh, okay, home run, not nearly as exciting as the Grand Slam. The Grand Slams are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, but a home run is still pretty damn good. And this vaccine, most importantly, even though the level of protection it affords against getting infected is slightly less than the RNA vaccines, what is most important and a really important point to drive home here tonight is that all of them, all three of them, prevent severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. That is zero people out of 75,000 who were tested with these vaccines ended up dying as a consequence of COVID. So I think you might, if you had to roll the dice, say, well, I'll endure a little bit of an infection as long as it's not going to put me on a ventilator or result in my own demise. And in that case, all three of these vaccines work with equal efficacy. So, you know, there's this trite little bit of a phrase that, you know, when it's which vaccine should I get, the, the, the response is, well, the first one that you're offered. Um, and, I, and I think that's probably kind of right, right? I mean, it's a little bit like somebody pulls up and says, I have for you a black Maserati and it is yours for free. And you say, well, I'm gonna wait for the red one. Um, a red one might come by, but the problem might be a red one may not come by. And these vaccines, especially as we know here in Montgomery and Bucks County, the delivery of these vaccines is somewhat variable and this you're not likely to have the ability to shop for them. Um, and so my strong suggestion is because they are all equally effective at preventing severe disease and worse, um, you get the vaccine, my advice would be, you get the vaccine that is offered to you, they are all equally safe. Okay, so stop there. Let's see if we have some questions about vaccines. Um, Michael, while you're looking, there were a couple of questions that were answered that I wanted to sort of knock off um, quickly here because a few questions kind of focused in the same group. Um, so for those who are concerned that this might've been rushed, if your question is, well, were these vaccines rushed? They seemed like that was kind of quick. Uh, my answer is, oh, absolutely they were. Um, but what was rushed was all of the red tape and all of the bureaucracy. This is an indication of how quickly we can do things when we put our mind to it. And there was an imperative to do this because thousands of people were dying and many, many more were losing their jobs and were suffering. And there was a global imperative to speed this up. What was not compromised, corners were not cut when it came to safety trials. Um, so, and that has been borne out not just by the clinical trials, but by now the, what did I say, 77 million people who've received vaccines um, um, without virtually any uh, downsides. Um, it is safe for everyone. So one of the questions was, is it safe for pregnant women? Is it safe for women who are trying to get pregnant? The answer is yes, it is. Um, this RNA that goes into your arm, as I mentioned before, is gone within 24 hours. And so it will do nothing more than what the actual infection will do, um, except in this case of the vaccine, it won't make you sick, whereas the actual infection can cause problems and certainly not something that would be welcome if you're a pregnant woman or you're a woman who's trying to get pregnant. Um, in terms of who shouldn't get the vaccine, um, again, not a physician, so I want to be careful here. The only people that are recommended to have a thoughtful conversation about whether to get the vaccine are individuals who've had anaphylactic reactions to other vaccines before. Um, so after your vaccine, you will be watched for 15 minutes just to make sure that you don't have a response. They have EpiPens and they have uh, medicines to take care of you. And if after those 15 minutes you're fine, um, then there will be no downsides uh, to getting this vaccine. And those side effects, the anaphylactic reaction, are one in hundreds of thousands of, of individuals. So um, I can't tell you how to feel, um, but there is no reason to be nervous about this. Um, kids are not yet being vaccinated, not because the vaccine is dangerous for them, but they just weren't part of clinical trials. Now they are. So 
Uh, kids are now being included in Moderna, Pfizer, and j, &J clinical trials, um, kids younger than <clears throat> 16 years of age. Um, and my bet, my prediction would be that by July, um, plus or minus, probably before school starts in the fall, um, most kids will be offered this vaccine. Kids are not more vulnerable. If you think about the standard kid that shows up at their you know, well visit after six months, they get measles, mumps, rubella, DPT, polio, um, the uh, um, chickenpox vaccine. They get a whole raft of things and most kids do just fine with those. Um, so we, I have no reason to think that there's gonna be any problem. We just have to make sure that we go through safety trials with children uh, the way we went through safety trials with adults. Glenn, on a related uh, topic, as you're talking about right now, you talked about the children's testing going on. Is that age-driven or is that size-driven? Because we have a question around, um, we have little people out there that are underweight, uh, but yet they're of age. So, yeah, these are really good questions. Um, thanks to whoever asked this one. So. We think about dosages with regard to weight and things like that with things like um, how much Motrin or how much Tylenol to give a kid or how much amoxicillin to give. So we tend to think about weights and dosages of, of medicines, but vaccines aren't medicines. Vaccines are given to someone to prevent a disease, not to treat a disease that they already have, right? So like a um, uh, an antibiotic uh, um, that a kid might get, the amoxicillin, um, that might be predicated on how, not only how old a child is, but also how much that child weighs. Vaccines are kind of binary. I've tried to tell you, don't think in binary terms, but actually vaccines are kind of binary. You make an immune response or you don't. And so it kind of doesn't matter um, how much you weigh, the immune response that you make is gonna either be on or off, or well, following a vaccine, it will be, it will be on. I think I'm correct in saying that at least for the Moderna children's trials, they are trying a range of doses, um, 150 and 25 nanograms or the, um, or micrograms, sorry, are the, uh, are the doses of these vaccines. My, my strong prediction is there will be no distinction um, in among those three doses, either in terms of protection or any kind of potential side effects for those kids. So I don't think weight matters. Another question is, does the J&J vaccine have preservative that allows So the J&J, yep, the J&J vaccine doesn't have preservatives, but it's been made in a different, it's, it's been processed in a, in a different way. And these preservatives, by the way, have been used in vaccines for some period of time. This is not a thing to be particularly concerned about, although if that were a real problem or concern for you, that might skew you more toward the RNA vaccines which don't have the preservatives. Uh, to be honest, it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure I know exactly what else the J&J &J vaccine contains. Um, I think it too is relatively preservative free. Um, we have tried arduously to get rid of any preservatives that are in most vaccines. There was a, va a preservative in the flu vaccine called Flimerosol. It's a mercury derivative um, that um, uh, came out some years ago. And so preservatives are not commonly found in vaccines any longer. I believe I'm correct in saying the J&J &J doesn't have them, um, but the J&G, the, the way in which that, that vector was made was a different process than the way the RNA vaccines were made. This message is for, from Lorraine Bottoms. I have spoken to some very trusted physicians concerned about the altering of genetics on, on the cellular level with the RNA vaccines. Can you speak to this? So I can. Um, it is, so again, here I think we trust, we trust the source, I hope, maybe. Um, so let's talk for just a second about what happens at a cellular level here. So when the RNA, let's say you get the RNA vaccine. So the, the RNA vaccine, the nurse injects it into your arm. It's covered in the lipid particles, your cells gobble it up, and now it's deposited into the cytoplasm of your cell. In the cytoplasm is where this RNA is gonna get turned into the spike protein. It's in the nucleus 
that your genetic material, your DNA is kept. So another metaphor, here it comes. This one's uh, all for free. Think about this, like the difference between the bank and the vault within the bank. The genetics are kept inside the vault. So even though you get into the bank, you're not necessarily given permission to go into the vault. There is no process that we know of by which RNA can make its way into the nucleus. And not only would it have to be able to do that, but it would actually have to get turned into DNA and insert itself into your genetic material, it would have to sneak into the vault and then in incorporate into your DNA in order to cause the kind of genetic problems that we're talking about here. The final thing is, let's just put on a science fiction hat and say that happens. It's all happening where? It's happening right here. All of that is happening in muscle cells in your arm that have a very short half-life to begin with. I think some of the worries that people had are, what if it goes into my eggs or into my sperm? There is no way, I promise, no way that this RNA injected up into your arm that stays where it's put is gonna make its way like a missile down to your ovary and inject itself into your egg cells reverse transcribe to DNA, incorporate into genetics and cause genetic problems. So can I promise this? No, uh, because this virus and this vaccine has not been with us for very long. But I am so certain that scientists never say never, but I am so certain that, that this couldn't happen because we know what the biological logical processes would have to be in order for that to occur, and they are impossible. So for those reasons, I don't believe that this vaccine or any vaccines, RNA vaccines or otherwise, are going to mutate or cause long-lasting genetic concerns and problems. And I know that there have been people who've talked about them. I would love to hear a rational possible outcome by which something like that could occur. It's not to suggest that these physicians are not thinking about this clearly or that they don't have concerns. Certainly they can have concerns. This is why we have events like these, but um, I, this is not a thing I worry about. We are at eight o'clock. We are going to continue because we have a lot of great questions going on. If you cannot stay, please know that we have a recording of this up on our website, uh, but we are gonna continue with the questions. Thanks to Glenn. Glenn, we have another question. Can you speak to the recent news that the vaccine helps long haulers? Oh, it does seem it's still preliminary. So this is not a peer reviewed publication quite yet, but it would appear that individuals who have been suffering, so who've gotten infected, um, who have had continuous challenges or illness, and then they get the vaccine, that the vaccine is somehow able to mitigate, if not eliminate, the long hauler illness or the long hauler challenges. That has all kinds of interesting ramifications because the implication would be that the long hauler disease is caused more by the virus, a virus that you didn't get rid of, than by an out of control immune response. Um, Again, this has not yet been formally published, but the evidence certainly looks compelling. Um, and the news is in the right direction. It's good news that for individuals that do seem to have long hauler problems that they may benefit from, um, and it would be, I think it's true for any of the vaccines that they would benefit from receiving a vaccine. Thank you. So Michael, let's do maybe one more and then we can kind of wrap up and I'll stick around if people have some other questions. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I'll also give out my email. Okay, uh, this question is from Carol. It's a long one, so bear with me. The <laughs> issue of immune escape has surfaced recently from the viral specialist in a letter to WHO, saying the results of the vaccine immuniz immunization can create something like a bug or with antibiotics. Can you elaborate? So I'm looking at the question. So let me see, let me make sure I understand this. The issue of immune escape has surfaced recently from a viral specialist in a letter to the WHO saying the results of vaccine immunizations can create something like superbugs. Well, I, I don't, well, all right, let's see, how do I, how do we do this? So um, I have spent uh, most of my waking hours um, reading 
COVID papers. I can't tell you how happy I'm going to be when this pandemic is behind me so I can read something else for the love of God. And, um, and even with that, I don't know about this letter to the World Health Organization. Um, not to be disparaging, and I'm trying to be open-minded, but simply because someone writes a letter to the World Health Organization doesn't necessarily prove that there's validity to this, right? So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. So here's what a protein looks like. So let's just talk for just a second about immune escape, because I think that's an important question um, that does come up in other contexts. So we're going to do a demo. So this is what a protein looks like for the most part, right? It is a globular three-dimensional structure with lots and lots of nooks and crannies. The neutralizing antibodies, here, I'll pull this up close. The neutralizing antibodies bind to particular domains or they're called motifs. They're sort of three-dimensional structures on the surface of this protein. So let's make, let's say that this is the spike protein. Spike protein doesn't look like this at all, but for the purposes of this. What we know is true is that the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 has approximately 20 of these little domains that neutralizing antibodies can bind to. So I've done this example before and I've used paper clips where I put like a little paper clip here and a little paper clip there. So on any given spike protein, there are about 20 of these domains. What we know happens with a variant is that maybe one of those domains goes away. One of those domains is mutated. And so now neutralizing antibodies can't bind to it because it doesn't look like these, these, these neutralizing antibodies work in a lock and key kind of way. So now the key or the lock has been changed and now the key won't work in that one but there are still 19 others. So the idea that there is going to be immunological escape for this virus, and that somehow that's gonna translate into superbugs, which is the implication apparently of the WHO letter um, that was sent by whoever this person is, um, I think is sort of the conspiracy theory. We're all attuned to those holy cow moments, right? When we heard about the variants, we're like, what more will this year bring? How much worse can it get? Um, and so when you hear, you know, well, can there be immune escape that creates superbugs? Um, I can't promise you anything, but I can tell you that there is no evidence in all of the science that's ever been done with viruses that would result in where immune escape is going to result in some sort of superbug scenario. And certainly nothing that would indicate the vaccine would do it, but that a regular viral infection would not. So I've tried to be consistent and, 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 and considerate about this question, but I really don't think, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, that there is any real concern uh, here whatsoever. This feels uh, misdirected. We have a question that's asking, after the second dose or after the one dose vaccine, how long after that are you considered protected? Good. An easy question. Um, so after the <laughs> after the first vaccine, what's that? I thought I'd throw that one in. Um, well, no, I'm just breaking out in a sweat over here. Uh, so after the first vaccine, um, about 12 days after the first vaccine is when we know that you have neutralizing antibodies. It differs. It can be 10, 11, 12, 13. But it's not like you get your first vaccine and you suddenly have superhero power. So it's not like you get your vaccine number one and you rip off your mask and you head to you know, your favorite bar. About 12 days after, you begin to see protection and value from this. Um, the conservative wisdom, and I'm now going to go against the conservative wisdom, uh, but don't tell anybody, is uh, that what you're told is that you are fully protected 12 days after the second vaccine. But actually, my guess is you were fully protected closer to about five or six days after the second vaccine. Because remember what I said, the first vaccine educates your immune response. The second vaccine reminds your immune response, right? It's sort of like a kid that crams for a, a test one night and then wakes up the next morning and tries to refresh it itself in preparation for the test. That second dose does not require a full 12 days for the neutralizing antibodies to be implemented. 
If you want to be on the conservative side, you wait about plus or minus two weeks after the second dose. And then, my friends, you do have superhero powers. You can take off your mask. You can hang out with other people who are vaccinated in small spaces um, without your masks on. Um, if the question is, can I take my mask off in public? The answer still is probably no, you kind of can't. In part because you're going to create confusion, right? Already, I go to, I, by the way, I live in Elkins Park. I love your Wegmans. My wife and I schlep all the way up 611 every single Sunday. It is my happy place to be. And one Sunday we went up there, everybody's wearing a mask except for one woman who wasn't wearing a mask. And it was the, the most hair on fire circumstance. People were just completely outraged by this. So even if you're doing it because you're like, hey, I'm vaccinated, I don't need to wear a mask, I'm safe, you're safe, it still is probably gonna protect you and provide a little bit of uh, social cover for you to wear a mask for a while. For a little while, we were concerned that um, even people who were vaccinated might still get infected. So I know that that sounds a little weird, but what we know the vaccines do is protect you from getting sick. But there was this red herring, almost like, you know, um, last minute twist that, well, you might be protected from getting sick, but you still perhaps could become infected. Um, and if that were true, you could be a carrier. That is, you'd be fine, but you might be able to transmit it to grandma or to your, you know, next door neighbor or whoever it is. With time, it seems like that is becoming less and less likely. So Israel has done a remarkable job in vaccinating its population. And studies coming out of Israel strongly suggest that the vaccination both reduces disease, which we knew, but also reduces transmission, which is reassuring. So I don't believe that if, you're in, if you've gotten vaccinated, that you still potentially could be a carrier um, of, of, the, of the vaccine. So, um, but wearing masks, I think is still, uh, a thoughtful, advisable thing to do until we as a society move to a different place, which is probably a good segue to the last point. Okay, Michael? Yep. So last things for you, and this is short. Um, there are things that I don't know. There are just things that I can't you know, promise you. Um, and I tried to be candid about some of the questions before because this virus has not been with us for a long time. But what is reassuring is with the exception of the disease spectrum that I talked to you about before, um, this virus isn't delivered to us, you know, straight from Hades, right? This is not, this virus abides by the rules of virology. We are completely certain as to why things happen with this particular pandemic. Um, and so while I can't promise um, that this won't cause some problems five, 10 years down the road. There is no precedent by which something like that is known to be true for any of the many viruses that have been studied for decades. So I can't tell you not to worry. I can't tell you not to believe those things. That's not my place. Um, but from a scientific virologist's perspective, we have no basis on which to ground that fear. Um, and I don't know, I'll speak for myself, not for you. I'm kind of ready not to be scared because um, it's been a rough year for all of us. Um, I think it's gonna take us a little while. I've often said it's taken us a while to climb down into this pit. Just think about a year ago today, how scared you were maybe and what you were doing and the kind of strange behaviors you were adopting. As I said at the beginning of this hour, you could hear doors slamming across the world as people were like, this sounds terrifying. And it took us a while to kind of work ourselves into this weird new normal where you put your masks on and where we behave in this way and where we don't see other people and where we have these really irritating Zoom meetings rather than something in person. And I think we have to be a little bit careful and gentle with ourselves that it's going to take us some time to get out of this pit too. It's not just going to be like the government says, okay, we've hit whatever we think herd immunity is, take your mask masks off and back to the way you were before, there's going to be some hesitancy. I'm a huge jazz fan. I'm a huge Philadelphia Orchestra fan. I can't wait to go back, but I can guarantee you the first time I go back and I'm sitting next to a couple people who I don't know, even though I'm vaccinated, it's going to be kind of weird to be around and close to strangers in those sorts of venues again. 
So just be patient with yourself because it took us a while to get here. It's gonna take us a while to get out of here. Um, and maybe, and my apologies that I'm gonna sound preachy, but I try to end every one of these talks the same way. Um, this is, I pray, a once in a lifetime circumstance for us. So somebody said, are we more likely to have these in the future? Yeah, in humanity's future, probably. In our future, I don't think so. Um, I think this is your pandemic. Uh, so uh, enjoy it while it lasts. So no, actually this is an opportunity for you to be part of the solution. Right? So you can roll your eyes. I can't see most of you. Um, so if I become insufferable, you can just say, my God, you're insufferable, but be part of the solution so that you get to tell your neighbors and your friends that you did a good thing. So give blood if you can, man, it's needed. Contribute or volunteer at a food bank, volunteer for vaccination efforts if you want. Um, Heaven knows we need people not to vaccinate. Don't worry, I'm not suggesting that you jab people in the arm, but we need people to log folks in and to ask the basic questions and to be part of the note keeping um, for this. And if you've gotten vaccines, and if you're happy that you did, tell other people about it, be ambassadors. Because a lot of the people who are anxious about getting vaccines, the way in which we change minds or the way in which we educate is when people are in our orbits, our parents, our sisters, our brothers, our neighbors, our friends, our fellow church members, when they get the vaccine and we can see that they're okay and that they're happy that they've got it, it's this way that we begin to move this dial. It's not, you know, talking heads like me who, you know, or, or Fauci, um, it's each of us that can change and empower, empower other people to do it. So if you are willing, and if you've gotten the vaccine, and if this is something that is capable for you to do, please participate in the solution. And that way, when this is behind us, you can sort of say, I had a little something to do with that. Glenn, a related note to that, can you speak to other things people can do other than wash your hands, wear your mask, and stay out of large groups, such as vitamins, supplements, um, well, sure. I mean, vitamins aren't ever going to be bad for you. Um, I take my vitamin each morning. I, I don't, they're, they're not going to help much. There was a report for a while that vitamin D uh, made a difference. Uh, vitamin D you can take by pills or you can actually just hang out in the sunshine, which I hope is back tomorrow. Um, and you will get or make vitamin D on your own. Vitamin D seems to perhaps, maybe, mitigate some of the, the symptoms should you get COVID. Um, but frankly, um, yeah, wash your hands short. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I feel like a high school teacher telling kids not to smoke, um, you know, but um, yeah, wash your hands, sure, stay away from crowds. But the thing that has saved our lives is this silly, annoying little mask, right? Because this virus goes in and out three holes in your body, two here, one here. And so if you cover this, if you provide a barrier here, not only do you prevent you from giving it to other people in case you're infected, but you also greatly minimize the risk that you will become infected by someone else if you happen to share you know, a sneeze cloud uh, by chance with them. So masks are king of the hill um, for this pandemic. Make sure you wear your mask correctly, by the way. I see a whole lot of people, and I don't just mean <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't just mean people who wear it under their nose. This uh, kind of boggles my mind. What I'm referring to here are people make sure it fits well, because um, if you've got spaces along the side, guess what? Air can sneak around those spaces and gain access to your, your uh, mouth and nose holes. So be sure that your mask is properly fit. But if you're wearing a mask loyally and it's properly fit and you certainly keep your hands washed and you don't touch your face like I probably have done 28 times tonight, um, you're going to be pretty well guarded. Um, the Cancer Center, um, by the way, a place that I love, um, we have had, to my knowledge, zero transmissions within the walls of the center. We've had people who've been infected, employees and patients who've come in our doors, but we have had zero transmissions. And it is because we are fiercely adamant about our mask wearing policy. Um, I, I'm sure there are people that don't like me because I will yell at anyone that I don't see a mask uh, correctly fit on their faces. Um, I think that alone is good testament to the power of, uh, of, of, of good mask wearing. Glenn, I have a personal question. Um, I, had, I had COVID back in April and I was put on hydrochloroquine 
Can you speak to any of the early drugs that were being used and their side effects, benefits, not benefits? How'd you do with hydrochloroquine? I don't remember three weeks of my life. Um, okay. So hydrochloroquine was a good idea uh, for a short while because hydrochloroquine is used as a drug to, this is the one that prevents malaria. So it is, um, the idea was, well, it prevents malaria from getting inside our cells. So maybe it works the same with coronaviruses. And so it was one of the very first, so not surprising that you were put on this, Michael. Um, it, there are so much better alternatives now. Uh, and hydrochloroquine can be pretty toxic to individuals too. Um, this is not something that you take the way that you would, you know, just pop a couple Tylenol. It's a, it's a pretty advanced placement kind of drug. It's all that we had when you had COVID back in April. If there was somebody that was going to catch COVID tomorrow, hydrochloroquine would not even be on the menu of things to potentially take. Um, we have now passive antibodies, which is super cool. Antibodies taken from somebody else that are transferred to you almost to provide a little bit of a band-aid to get you through that. We've got other drugs that are much more elegant that control the host immune response, things called tocilizumab, which is actually kind of a cancer medication that's been repurposed for this, that are safer and much more effective. What else, folks? Anyone have any other questions? Let me just check the chat box real quick. Actually, I have a question. Sure. I, oh, so, okay. What are your thoughts on people who get COVID around sometimes the notion of that, that they've engaged in risky behavior or they haven't been wearing their mask or that they've done something wrong and that's why they've gotten COVID? Oh, you're going to need to tell me more about this. So ask this again, the notion that they've- The like, notion that, that, yeah, that, that people today who get COVID because we know that we should wash our hands and do all the things that you that you've spoken to, so if you happen to get COVID today, what's your thoughts around the notion of someone saying, well, that individual that got COVID did something wrong or they oh. were in a crowd of people. So basically they got it because they engaged in behavior that they shouldn't be engaged in. Well, yeah. So this is, this is Glenn the, the person, not Glenn the scientist. Um, you know, um, I don't know. I just don't have energy anymore to judge other people. I, I, I'm busy enough, you know, trying to fix my own problems here. And it feels so unproductive and so uncharitable to say, well, you deserved it. You, you went to that bar, high school kid or college kid, I guess college kid, and now you deserve what you got. Like, this is like, that might, if you believe in karma, fine. If you want to sort of feel like, you know, people are responsible for their own healthcare decisions, yeah, I'd agree with that as well. But this is an infection that has killed, killed half a million people, well more than half a million people in the United States alone. Um, it is one of the most tragic events of our lifetimes. And this you don't wish on your worst of enemies. And so I find when somebody tells me at the cancer center, because, I talk a lot about COVID. Um, I, you know, I can't go get soup without getting stopped a couple times in the hallway. And usually those conversations, um, they're my favorite questions, are um, questions like, my son's girlfriend's mother, who works at Joanne Fabric, worked last Wednesday with a woman who came in who had, and I, I didn't give a damn a good couple minutes before. But what I will almost always ask is, how is she doing, right? Before we start trying to figure out, are you now vulnerable and could you possibly get sick? Ask the question when you know that somebody has been impacted, how are you? Are you okay? Are they okay? Um, rather than trying to ascribe blame. Again, it's me being kind of preachy. Um, and I guess you, are, you have prerogative to say, well, look, you did it to yourself, but I don't think anybody would will this on themselves. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly in my youth done a lot of naive things myself, so I'm not particularly in a place to judge. Is that the answer to, is that like an answer to your question, Bill? Yeah, I'm being just like scientifically. I mean, is it possible that you could do everything that you should be doing and still get COVID? 
Oh, so I just went into that little preachy thing for no reason. No, uh, I, no, I, I'm glad you did because I, th I think it's it was very good commentary. Absolutely, um, and I agree with um, you 100. percent But like you know, from a scientific perspective, every every person that I'm aware of who has gotten COVID can trace it back to a time where they were in a vulnerable position where they weren't abiding by the masking rules every single time. I don't know of a case, maybe somebody on this call does and I believe you, but I don't know of a case in which somebody like literally followed the rules, mask wearing all the time, didn't touch their eyes and face and still got infected. Okay. Glenn, thank you very much for your time. It's 8.23, we appreciate everyone staying on uh, longer. And Glenn, we certainly appreciate your time, your effort and your education on this. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that this session was recorded and will be on salemstrong.org. You can locate it on the website in about two days. Oh, you can down a social action and then learn more and the, web, and the uh, video recording will be there. I also want to remind everyone that next month we have uh, the ACLU speaking um, on Bring Me Your Poor, Your Hungry, Is America Still the Promised Land? So we want to thank Glenn again. Thank you so much. Wait, Glenn, Glenn, are you going to give us your email address? <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. So my email. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I forgot. So my email address, and this is, again, be patient with me. I'll write back to you, uh, but it may take a little while. My email address is my name, Glenn, G-L-E-N-N -N dot R-A-L-L -L at F-C-C-C -C dot E-D-U. So Frank, well, Fox Chase Cancer Center. So make sure it's three C's. Okay. Otherwise it goes to somebody at the Florida Christian College. So uh, three C's becomes important. Yeah, three C's. I have. And if you didn't get that, just go to Salem Strong and we can make sure we get and send us a note. We can get it to you. We do have it. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Uh, everyone stay safe and thank you for tuning in. Thank you everyone. Thank See you, you next month.